Well, good evening, everyone. It, uh, my cell phone just told me seven o'clock on the dot. So uh, I want to welcome you all to our second winter webinar series, Conservation in Action, brought to you by the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority's Imagine McGregor Program and Stewardship Team. And I would like to thank uh, our watershed restoration technician, Anastasia Hubelmans, for organizing this webinar series and its speakers. So thank you very much, Anastasia. Hopefully we'll get through tonight without too many technical difficulties. <laughs> we will begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of First Nations people who have long standing relationships to the land, water and region of Southwestern Ontario. We also acknowledge the local Lower Thames River watershed communities of this area, which include Muncie Delaware Nation, Delaware Nation, Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Caldwell Nation, and Oneida Nation of the Thames. We value the significant, significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island, North America. We are thankful for the opportunity to live, learn, and share with mutual respect and appreciation. So the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority, or the LTBCA, it's located in southwestern Ontario, as I'm sure many of you watching know, and is one of 36 of Ontario's conservation authorities. We are located downstream of the Upper Thames Region Conservation Authority, because the Thames is just that big, and our watershed contains a total of 55 smaller subwatersheds that drain into the Lower Thames River into Lake St. Clair or Lake Erie. Our region hosts prime agricultural land, and it's located in one of the country's most biodiverse regions, as you can see from the photo behind you, the Carolinian Zone. So this winter webinar, it aims to engage folks like yourself through our watershed who might be concerned about conservation and want to help. We encourage you to check out our YouTube video on the former recording on January 10th, Nature's Best Hope. Now tonight's presentation topic, our conservation in action, it is mostly geared towards individuals who can implement large scale restoration projects. But to be honest, there is something here for everyone, as long as you're interested to learn more about local conservation. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, we do have three presentations tonight, anywhere from 15 to 25 minutes long or so. Uh, there's myself, uh, yours truly, Sarah Rabideau, we'll be doing Species at Risk. Then we have Greg Van Every on habitat restoration and Colin Little on agricultural programs. Now we do encourage you throughout the presentations to please ask as many questions as you would like about the material or, or programs or anything in general about the LTBCA. And as you can see from this little box I've got here, um, as you look, if you look at your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A section, kind of got two little text box. And that's where we would like you to pose our questions. Uh, and one of our staff members, she's gonna go through and kind of moderate and mediate those questions so that by the time we get to the Q&A, um, we'll be able to, to get right to them. Now, I am not going to be available for the Q&A session. However, uh, please do ask whatever questions about species at risk you may have, and we will get back to you uh, through the event, right? And we'll let everybody know the responses to your questions. So please don't hesitate to do that. Oh no, it's lagging. Okay, I'm not. Whoa, too far. <laughs> okay, so uh, now that the, uh, that's all taken care of, uh, again, good evening. My name is Sarah Rabideau, and I am a member of our Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority Species at Risk team. Uh, I know with, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a little cough throat session. Uh, it is nighttime. Uh, that is a picture of me. Uh, if you're not sure what I look like, um, it's always nice to put a, a picture you know, a face to a voice. Uh, and yes, these are just a few wonderful images of some of our species at risk in our jurisdiction. So before we get into the presentation, just a real quick overview of what we'll talk about. First, I'm gonna talk about the Aquatic Species at Risk or SAR in our authority's jurisdiction. I'm gonna talk about some specific threats to these species, what we're doing to help, and particularly what everybody else can do to help as well. But, 
before I get into all of the species at risk, I want to take a moment to provide, excuse me, some information on what actually designates a species to be at risk. Now, there are a few different terms used for designating species, but tonight we're going to discuss the term used by COSEWIC, which is the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. Now, a species status, whether it's endangered or threatened, is determined by a multitude of factors. Uh, and COSEWIC is an independent advisory panel to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada. And they meet twice a year to assess the status of different wildlife species at risk of extinction, unfortunately. Now, the designations made by COSEWIC, as well as several other sources, they are considered by the federal government on whether a species will be listed under the Federal Species at Risk Act and given legal protection. The ones that we're going to talk about are species that are essentially special concern, threatened, or endangered. But one of the reasons I wanted to list extirpated here is because when I've talked to a lot of people about this, they're like, oh, is it endangered? Oh, it's extinct. They think it goes straight from one to the other, but there's actually this middle ground called extirpated. And what that means is that it no longer exists in the wild in Canada. So if you have a particular species whose range is from Canada and the US, and, they're, and they exist in the wild in the US, but no longer in Canada, that means that they're extirpated. And then of course, if they're no longer living in the wild anywhere, that's when they go extinct. So just a little kind of footnote. Oh no! <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so the Lower Thames River, it contains a significant amount of fish and mussel species at risk. Many different species have different designations. <clears throat> Excuse me, and they exist for a variety of reasons. There's different, uh, it depends on the distribution across the country, Canada, population numbers, the threats, and projected declines depending on those threats. So lots of reasons why any one species is designated a particular stat. Again, in this case, made by Kosiewicz. Now, historically, there are 94 species, approximately 94 species of fish that have been found in the Thames River. That's a lot. And 18 of them right now are species at risk. So almost 20% almost of our fish are at risk. Now, I know there's a lot of color going on the slide, so, so we'll work through it. At the bottom, you can see endangered, threatened, and special concern in their various colors. This is our list of the fish at risk in our watershed jurisdiction, and those are their statuses. So as you can see, quite a few different ones and lots of endangered species. And oh, there's that extirpated, the gravel chub at the top. We haven't had any observations of them in our watershed for almost uh, about 50 years. So they're, they're considered extirpated at this point. Now at the bottom, you'll see it says Kosiewicz and species at risk uh, fair designations. And as I mentioned, Kosiewicz kind of guides or uh, makes suggestions to the federal government and SARA is the legal, um, the law for which they can be afforded habitat protection, species protection. And as of 2019, pretty much all these guys match. So whatever the Kosiewicz designation is, is also the federal listing. Uh, so if the warmouth, for instance, is endangered, uh, it is so under federal law as well. I'm sorry, there's a lag, there we go. Okay, so same slide. Um, but this one shows things from a slightly different perspective. And when you're in biology, you always have to look at things from different perspectives to get the whole picture. So the slide before talked about designations. Here, we're going to look at which ones are historic. So observations found, oh, sorry about that. My phone's going off. <laughs> which species on our list are found historically? So essentially observations made in our watershed before the year 2000 and any that are current. Um, this was kind of a, a cutoff made by our, our authority and uh, myself and our species at risk biologists. We were working on a big assessment, which we'll talk about soon. We were trying to think of a way to do this, and year 2000 seemed to be a pretty decent cutoff, about 20 years. Um, so as you can see, there's four species historic, and even though the watershed has retained quite a few fish species, uh, you know, threats still remain imminent to, to many of them. <clears throat> okay. So in addition to our many fish species, there's also approximately 35, 36 species of mussels that have been historically found here. And of these, 15 are now considered species at risk. So 43%, getting closer to that halfway mark. 
Uh, similarly to the other screen, here are the endangered, threatened, and special concern species. So as you can see, an awful lot of species. And yes, we do have native freshwater mussels. They're not all just the invasive quagga mussels and zebra mussels, which we'll, we'll get you soon. So yeah, nearly a fifth of our fish species are at risk and nearly half. So uh, definitely some, uh, help. they need some help. <laughs> Next slide, if it will work for me. There we go. So again, uh, historic versus current. Uh, we've got several that are considered historic and all of these ones are designated endangered. Uh, there are three that have currently been found. So again, observations since the year 2000 by various agencies that are out there doing muscle surveys. Fawn's foot, let me put, are endangered, but they are still, still hanging around. Let us take a quick minute to talk about the life cycle of a freshwater mussel. These guys require an intermediary host to complete their life cycle. Some mussels have very specific hosts, and we'll give one example in a second, but others can have multiple fish hosts. The, um, now, adult female mussels, they release their larvae into the water known as glochidia, and they actually attach onto the gills of fish. And the glochidia remain attached to the fish gills for a period of time, pretty much sucking out nutrients from the bloodstream, because that's what's running through the gills, and then they detach. And when they fall, that's where they end up and they mature into adults. It's actually really cool. If you check out YouTube, just, you know, kind of videos of, of mussels, many of them have actually lures that they, that they pop out. And they look like fish or all sorts of things to attract their fish host to them. And then they grab onto the fish uh, once they get attracted, almost like a Venus flytrap but they're not trying to hurt them. They just want to hold them and then they pump their glochidia into their, into their gills and then let them go. It's really quite cool. So here's one of our examples. Um, uh, the hickory nut, uh, as you can see here at the bottom, this guy, his host fish is lake sturgeon, which is also at risk. So they are seeing a distribution, uh, decline in distribution because their fish host is, is also declining. Okay. Species at risk, fish and mussels. We know that they're located throughout the watershed. And as you can see in the left-hand map, many sub-watersheds along the Thames River, as well as Rondo Bay, they contain species. So anyone that's colored, depending on the color, if you look at the legend, that's how many species at risk are in the watershed, either it's tributaries or the Thames running through it. So quite a few. Now, in addition to the areas that contain these species, sub-watersheds upstream of the area also impact species due to obvious water flow. Every sub-watershed that drains into the Thames River impacts species to some degree. Now, as you can see, the greatest number of different species here actually occur in the eastern end of our watershed and fewer and fewer are recorded as you move downstream. This is indicating cumulative impacts from upstream. Now, I gotta say, this map does not, it does not suggest that a specific impact is occurring at any one location there at the Thames that's going to cause the species to decline. Kind of looks like it, but there isn't necessarily. It's just how the map worked out. The whole point of the map is just to have the broad idea that upstream activities can certainly impact downstream species with fewer and fewer numbers. Does it work? Yeah. So aquatic threats, we know there's a lot of them. We got a checklist here. Uh, and as you can see, there's actually a few at the bottom that are more specific to mussels than to fish. So habitat loss, well, we know about agricultural lands and drainage. There are those invasive species, zebra and quagga mussels, round goby and carp, to name a few. Pollution, contaminants, toxic compounds, often from potentially agricultural and urban runoff. Barriers to movement like dams and pumps. Incidental harvest, so recreation and bait fishing, right? So taking the fish and not even realizing what species you have. Thermal effects, temperature incre increase in water with loss of riparian habitat. So that nice vegetation along water courses, that's, that's the riparian habitat. And one people don't necessarily think about is recreational activities. So things that can physically harm a species. So it's under mussels because if you have livestock like cows entering a water course or even ATVs, they could potentially crush the mussels in the bottom. So um, those are also uh, important threats as well. So now, if it will let me, here we go. So now we're going to get into uh, a few 
actual species with some nice photos, and but also talk about threats to them and uh, particularly emphasize solutions for each of those threats. So for instance, here at the top, the riverbed horse. Due to its narrow range of habitat preferences, spawning requirements, and intolerance of high turbidity, siltation, and pollution, this guy is susceptible to a number of threats. He and many other species, unfortunately. Habitat fragmentation can alter their habitat conditions so they can't move around very much. Changes in flow regime and saltation of the spawning habitat can, it can reduce recruitment because the eggs don't get enough oxygen when they're released. Agriculture, industrial, municipal activities, they can affect water quality, which of course impacts these guys. As can things like climate change, invasive species, disease, incidental harvest, lots of things that we'd already mentioned. And of course, there's some fish species that just have very specific habitat preferences. So if you mess with any one of those, you're messing directly with species. So here we have a picture of one of our endangered mussel species, the lily pole. And here are a couple photos of erosion during high rainfall events causing sedimentation of water courses. And I'm sure all of you have seen that as of late. But Picture here in the left-hand corner that sedimentation coming off the field, something that can very easily be mitigated. Grassed waterways, they can hold soil in place, prevent erosion, especially during storms, and they can also reduce the amount of pesticides reaching water. No-till farming and cover crops can also reduce erosion uh, for things like, you know, mussels like lilyput and even the sky, the threatened maple leaf. Here we have the endangered snuffbox. Um, and here's an example of the livestock in streams and things like their waste can uh, pollute mussels and fish habitat with nutrients and bacteria. And as I said, unfortunately crush the mussels. Some simple solutions, exclusion fencing and alternative watering sourcing projects. That's not only just gonna help the fish and mussels but all of the uh, biota in the water course make it nice and healthy. And our stewardship team would love to talk with you if you have cows and wanna help them out that way. Another example, this is the spotted gar. This is a beautiful fish. Uh, this is actually, this guy lives in Rondo Bay. And habitat destruction of the North Shore of Lake Erie has very serious effects on many species, including this guy. So one of the ways to help this is to leave an edge of uncut lawn next to watercourses to minimize runoff. So don't go all the way, leave a spot for the vegetation to grow up, sh trees, shrubs, make a nice riparian zone habitat. Another thing is your downspout. If you can pop it into a rain barrel, you're reducing the sedimentation, reducing the runoff. And every year, our authority does have a sale on rain barrels. So if you're interested, we can certainly help you with that. Here's a picture of our northern riffle shell, one of the mussels. I'm sure everybody has seen uh, algae blooms on the Thames at some point, And that's typically caused by high nutrient levels. So what is the way we can you know, solve that problem? Well, one of the ways everybody can is if they use fertilizers, incorporate them 48 hours prior to any forecast or rainfall events, and it will certainly help reduce things like algae blooms. Here's our rainbow mussel, uh, and this guy, as well as its other mussel friends, you could say, are impacted by, again, urban runoff, uh, road salt, things like that. So one of the solutions, of course, for every one of us to do, maintain our cars and use uh, specific facilities like car washes uh, to reduce the risk of it just going down the drain. Another one, here's our round pig toe, an example of this guy. And there's the zebra mussels, which I suspect most of our listeners have either seen or heard about. Um, a lot of people, when I talk to about mussels, they're, oh, zebra mussels, and they don't even realize we have our own set of, of freshwater mussel species. So these are the little guys that when they attach to our fresh, our bigger freshwater species, they interrupt feeding, breathing, pretty much everything the mussel needs to do. So what's the best way to solve this problem? Uh, removing plants, animals, and mud from your boat, equipment and trailer, disposing of them on dry land or in the garbage. It's going to help prevent them from moving from one spot to the next. Don't mind me, just having some water. So what is the LTVCA doing to help our, well, our species at risk? Well, we're participating in the development of their species designation. As I was talking about at the beginning, there's so many steps. 
uh, status reports, recovery strategies, management plans, so assisting with those based on the knowledge that we obtain. Locating and monitoring our aquatic species through fish and mussel surveys uh, for the physical species or even the e even their DNA that's kind of fluffed off and uh, in the water column, that's called eDNA uh, sampling. And of course, there's lots of desktop uh, mapping work to do too. We identify where threats occur and what can be done to address them, which I will talk about that in a second. Of course, one of the things we want to emphasize tonight, approaching landowners to determine interest in projects and of course, implementing them. So one of the things that was recently done was a sub watershed prioritization. So remember I talked about those 55 different sub watersheds? Well, we collected a whole bunch of baseline data, did some analyses and some, some mapping. And we wanted to figure out where's the best starting point. We know they all kind of need some, some TLC, but where do we start first? So we did this assessment and I'll show you a map of where we want to start first. Now, this assessment had a ton of factors, but we picked th these ones you can see here in the table because they all can be calculated, they're quantitative and they can be measured as can the restoration efforts to mitigate them. So the number of species impacted, uh, how much soil erosion is going on, how much riparian zone is there, how much per what percentage of the water courses are actually being shaded, what's the length of constructed drains, what's the water quality like when it comes to exceedance values, nitrogen, pesticides. On this bottom one, the Hilsenhoff Family Biotic Index, all about bugs. So water quality, you could do called uh, serving surveys for something called benthic, uh, benthic macroinvertebrates, which is a fancy word for bugs. And depending on what you find, tells you a lot about the water quality. So using all of these, uh, we made our assessment. Now, 14 subwatersheds were excluded because no observations of species have been in them. On to the map, if it will let me. Come on. Whoop, too far. <laughs> okay, so here in our eastern end, the ones in purple are currently our highest priority. And this is where we would be gaining for any restoration efforts, the biggest bang for our buck on a per hectare value. This is where it's occurring. So if you happen to live in one of these areas, uh, give us a show. We'd love to talk to you about some restoration projects. And on our west end, these are our sub watersheds that will benefit based on their sheer size. Um, these are also areas close to species at risk habitat, the Thames River, McGregor, Baptist Creeks, all priority areas. So once again, we want to do restoration and mitigation, keep valuable soil on the land. We want to prevent those nutrient floods, improve water quality. Those are some of the best ways that we're going to help recovery and survival of our species at risk. Now here's a few different products that the LTVCA has produced to, to communicate this information. Uh, information on buffers and wetlands, making those, livestock exclusion, as I was mentioning. Uh, and as at the bottom, it does say assistance is available. And uh, I know Greg is going to talk more about that. And I believe Colin will be too. And we can, you can contact them at stewardship at ltvca.ca. Kind of back to our species at risk, we have a brand new website, which you can see on the right side there. And on our left are a couple of really handy guidebooks that uh, some of our staff did a fantastic job producing. And it goes through and talks about each of our at-risk fish and mussels. So I highly recommend checking those out. Here are some more outreach uh, endeavors. Here's a sign on the left-hand side that shows a particular area has been designated as protected for aquatic species. Now, if you're traveling through the watershed, you might actually see one of these at Tecumseh Park, Thames Grove Dock, Jeanette's Creek, Lighthouse Cove, and Rondo Bay. And here is a brand new in draft mode uh, poster that will hopefully be at Rondo Bay very soon talking about the species. Here are some flyers that we've recently uh, distributed to educate the public on aquatic species, particularly around the Thames River. And here's the same set, but focusing on Rondo Bay. Again, Emphasizing what can landowners do? 100% one of the best things you can do is undertake projects on your property and reaching out to us because we would love to help uh, uh, coordinate with you to figure out what the best mode of action is. Going with recover, excuse me, recovery activities through stewardship, best management practices, we reduce threats and we create a wonderful partnership and collaboration. 
And here are several stewardship contacts, which if you go to your, our website, you'll be able to find those there. But again, stewardship at ltvca.ca is going to be the best spot to go. Thank you very much for listening to this chat about species at risk. I know it was a lot to kind of go through and there was a lot of information. And if you have any specific questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we will get back to you. And uh, if you have any other specific information about our program, please contact our species at risk biologist, vicki.mckay at lcbca.ca. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Sarah. That was fantastic. Uh, great presentation. Very informative. Where did you go, Anastasia? Here. What do you need? <laughs> Sorry. Can you hear me? Let me know, Anastasia, if, if uh, the audio is good and you can see my screen. I can hear you, Greg. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, yeah. Okay, I can see your screen too, so you're good to go. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you, Sarah. That was a great presentation. Very informative on some of the species of risk that uh, probably not a lot of people know about around here. And uh, they're very uh, good indicators of our water quality, which we need to keep track of because everybody's 70% water. So very important. Anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the stewardship programming that we have that relates to uh, mitigation of some of these species. And also after me, Colin will go into more agricultural uh, targeted programs. But um, I'll begin by talking about a little bit about natural heritage here. Um, you know, we've got 4%, less than 4% forest cover, as you may know, if you're from Chatham Kent, um, it is, um, you know, dwindling all the time. And so it's the, it's the least remaining natural cover of any upper tier municipality in Ontario. So um, to, to offset that, we are looking to sign people up to do more programming and, and offer incentive funds for reforestation, tall grass buffers, pollinator projects, wetlands, and cover crops, which Colin will get into a bit later. Now, these stewardship projects are not taking out prime agriculture land. We're looking at marginal areas of the farm. And um, most notably, people are, you know, using larger and larger equipment. And so there are, there are pieces of land, typically next to drains and low areas that um, are better off suited as ecosystem services. The importance of these habitat types, uh, for example, reforestation, there is a lot of biodiversity in in a, in a forest, and that leads to climate resilience. There are so many things going on in a forest, it's, it's we don't even, we have not grasped the entire, um, uh, you know, we don't know everything that's going on. There's so many things that we have not discovered. For example, you know, um, medicinal aids and, and medicines all come, basically are derived from plants, and so, we need these forests because they are so diverse and it's the diversity that, that helps our society uh, be resilient to disease and, and any kind of pests that may migrate in that are foreign. And so that biodiversity helps take care of pressures on forests or our local environment. And so we need that, it's very important. Um, it also helps water recharge, purification. Um, forests, as you can imagine, hold a lot of water and also respirate a lot of water back into the air. It helps our mental well being. Uh, it's a proven fact also that um, you know, when you walk out in the forest, you feel a lot better. Um, you know, a few breaths of fresh air walking a trail 
definitely helps me uh, cope with stress. And uh, that's very important as well. Air quality and carbon sequestration, uh, another crucial thing. So, you know, uh, we, of course we need food and that's why we have a, a, a high agricultural industry, but we also need air and water. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about the total system of ecology. Um, now, for example, prairie habitats are good for pollinators. They have deep roots that pull minerals to the surface that otherwise couldn't make it up. Uh, they harbor predatory insects, which are good for crops um, and crop and you know insects that prey on crops. They are a good food source for migratory birds as well. Um, not only the seeds of the plants, but also the insects that may live within those pollinator habitats. Uh, the importance of wetlands. Uh, what we're trying to achieve with that is uh, we want to decrease the nutrient and sediment loading <clears throat> into, this, into our source water, which, um, you know, helps uh, the municipal intake. As well, we want to improve the groundwater recharge. So slowing that water down and letting it infiltrate is key. We want to slow runoff and reduce erosion concerns. And we also uh, find that they are, you know, they're increased migratory bird habitat, of course, and resting areas, staging grounds for, uh, you know, the ducks and a lot of water and shorebirds, even your typical songbirds use these areas to, uh, um, you know, feed and, and pair and um, it's very attractive. A water source is always attractive to wildlife uh, as well. Now the program eligibility for most of our projects or like our stewardship projects for, for reforestation and prairie establishment, <clears throat> You know, to qualify, you're going to have to be willing to prepare the site, uh, and that may look different for different sites, uh, depending on what kind of ground cover you have existing and, and how, um, how, how wet it is uh, currently and the access point. And you need to be willing to prepare that and maintain the trees or grass for the first three years. So for trees, um, you know, you need to... Uh, either prepare the site by eliminating strips of grass or, and then if you're going to do uh, a prairie site, you need to get rid of the cool season grass somehow so that you can put in the native grass. The thing with the cool season grass is it's a very um, heavy competitor with trees and native grasses. And the reason for that is because it, it creates a sod layer and that sod layer will uh, take up a lot of moisture in a dry period of the year and it will it will stunt your trees. We've done plantings where we've done them in old hay fields and without proper maintenance uh, those trees uh, are stunted and they they hardly grow. I can go back three years later and you might see the tree being about uh, you know 36 inches maximum. Whereas if you keep the grass away from the base of those trees, you're looking at six feet maximum or even more. So it's a drastic difference on the growth rate of trees when you keep the grass back. The thing with native grasses is you can combine them with tree planting because they are more of a clumping style of grass or a sedge type of grass where there is a lot more space between the grass clumps and it's not completely making that sod layer and taking all that moisture away. We often use cover crops such as white clover because it grows low uh, and you can still see your smaller trees in it and it does not make a sod layer that uh, would take moisture away from the trees in a dry time. You can see more on our fact sheet on site preparation and maintenance at our website. I mean, you know, this is a pretty long link here, but you know, if you just Google Lower Thames tree planting, you will get to our site. There are a bunch of informational um, guide uh, PDFs on that site. Uh, now you also need a minimum of one acre to 
uh, of planting area to qualify. So that's, you know, either it's one acre in size or it's approximately 600 trees. That's the rate of planting that we uh, would do. But you can do windbreaks um, that consist of at least 600 trees. Those are eligible as well. Uh, you have to be, so you have to sign as a landowner, you have to sign a 15 year management agreement, which, you know, just make sure that you are willing to establish the trees via maintenance and, uh, and continue that. And, and it's because we're, we're putting a lot of investment into finding the funding to bring to the community to offer to landowners, but we need results and the results come in this agreement. We need an agreement that it's going to be taken care of. And so that's why we have the agreement. Now it's not a lengthy agreement. Um, you can, you know, read it in, you know, five minutes, but it just basically states that you, you know, you need to take care of this project. It's not that you plant the trees or plant the grass and walk away. There are some uh, considerations, and um, for maintenance for a pollinator project, for instance, you, you know, there's certain times of year that you need to mow. So in the middle of June, when the when uh, you know, the cool season grass starts to flower, that's the kind of ideal time to mow your prairie because all the warm season grass will come up underneath and come through that and be more um, uh, aggressive during the middle of summer, late summer. And you'll get uh, better results by mowing in that early summer stage. As far as trees, you know, you need to either mow or keep that grass, as I said, away from the base of the trees, which you can use mulch, uh, you can use herbicide. There are several different ways to do it. Um, and that's up to you, but it does need to be done to see maximum results. We also have, uh, for a reforestation program, it's called the 50 million tree program. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, this is from Forest Ontario. Again, it's the 600 trees, one acre planting area. They cover $1.36 per tree. And that, that funding will go toward tree cost and the cost of planting those trees before tax. Um, it's uh, this program um, is useful for block planting or windbreaks are the eligibility for that. And uh, only native species though, and they will not, um, fun shrubs. And so there's no Colorado blue spruce, there's no Austrian pine available for this particular program. We also have a partnership with Ontario Power Generation. Similar, we, you know, we have to plant 600 trees plus on one acre or more, and they will fund up to 35% of the total project cost, including tree costs and planting costs before tax. We have our general seed, seedling program, which anyone in, from the public can buy trees from us. They just have to go to our website and, and have a look at our species list and decide what they want. The trees are about a dollar or two a piece. They range um, between species. And you can get our form on the website, www.ltdca.ca. Now, I will uh, remind people, it's a minimum of 10 seedlings per species, okay? Because we, as you can imagine, we're um, not very many staff and we're in a, in a cold storage with 90,000 trees and we cannot feasibly pull apart the bundles of 10 and try to count out three and four and five. So um, please bear with us on that. But uh, the trees are re reasonable. Uh, reasonably priced because we do such a large volume and um, we ask that you uh, order a minimum of 10 per species. We are also doing buffers with tall grass and cover crops. We can do buffers with almost anything. It's just having the buffer along drains or around water courses that really helps uh, as you heard in the previous presentation. So we have funding that we'll, um, the funding is always uh, sort of improved uh, when you can say, hey, look, I got this drain and I want to put a buffer along it. Well, usually we can find 
um, several grants to put towards a cause like that. And so it's about, it's about keeping that sediment nutrients out of the drain and keeping those erosion, uh, water erosion uh, back from the edge to reduce that sediment. So now each project varies and, and they're all unique. So, you know, when you want to do a project with us, it's very important that you reach out to us and have a chat with us and we can come out to the site, have a look around and see what you want to do and, and determine what you qualify for and, uh, and maybe offer some advice on what to do next or how to, uh, you know, how to restore your property if you're interested. So our wetland programming, what we do is we find uh, money, we acquire it through various sources um, for landowners to excavate wetlands in marginal areas, um, mostly offline or natural water courses. What that means is um, offline means not in the drain. And if it is in the drain, it has to be, a well, usually it's a natural water course. The reason why you can do it in a drain, you can do it in a water course, but there is a significant amount of paperwork to go through to get the permits to do that. So it's a lot longer process. Um, you know, we have to um, go through uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and make sure that they understand what we're doing and that we, and that they approve what we're doing before we can ever do anything in a drain. Um, and we also have to work with our drainage, uh, uh, Chatham Kent drainage to make sure that they understand what we're doing and, and how it affects what they do. So there, it's not without uh, doing your homework and, and making a plan that is um, that no one can poke holes in. And so, um, but we do it. We do it all the time, and that's why we're here. So um, I wouldn't scare anybody away from wanting to do something. The offline ponds that we do, wetlands, are a lot easier. I mean, typically in most cases, we don't need to. Um, talk to drainage because it's not in a drainage ditch. We don't need to go through DFO because it's nothing to do with uh, navigable waterways or uh, the fish or species at risk in that uh, drain. So those are a little bit easier, but um, anyway, just to give you an idea of what, what's, um, you know, what the process is. Uh, some of our partners include Ducks Unlimited Canada, of course, for wetlands, uh, the Environment uh, and Climate Change Canada, Wildlife Habitat Canada, Project Landowners, of course, and uh, the ECWP is the Elgin Clean Water Program, which is run out of um, the Kettle Creek Conservation Authority, but they overlap with our watershed in Elgin, so we get um, some access to that, that funding. Uh, ESC stands for Elgin Stewardship Council. They are still in operation in Elgin County and we partner on many projects with them. Uh, we have our ALICE program, which I'm going to get into in a second. Um, Ridge Landfill Community Trust offers funding down in the South Kent area. And we have uh, more partners than that. Uh, we, they come and go all the time, but we're always looking for new funds to replenish and um, keep our programs going and so far so good. We've only been expanding our programming and, and we haven't taken anything away. So we're pretty proud of that. And the team has done a great job. So this is a typical wetland after five years, you know, it starts to grow in, it starts to um, do its function a little, a little more efficiently. You can see there's no open soil now and the shrubs and, and trees are starting to grow in around it. This is at one of our CA properties, like our conservation areas. It's called the Ward property. It's out uh, on Stevenson Road near the Merlin area. Okay, so the ALICE program stands for Alternative Land Use Service. Now, we have been working on with these uh, people for uh, quite a few years, I think over five years now. And we have established Alice communities in Chatham Kent, Elgin, Middlesex, and Lambton. So basically anywhere around here, you can gain access to this program. 
The way it works is uh, it's governed by a project advisory committee, which is called the PAC committee. It consists of, um, well, the Chatham-Kent one consists of 15 members. It depends on the community. But a minimum of those PAC members have to be farm producers. This program provides annual payments for each acre enrolled in the program. Um, now, each community has its own rates. The rates for Chatham-Kent are $175 an acre for most projects, $225 an acre for the first six meters along any water course. And that's because we feel, you know, those areas are very important. And that's where we want to be doing these buffers and keeping that erosion and nutrients uh, out of the streams. So there's a bit of a higher rate for that. And then uh, $85 an acre for delayed hay. And for those of you who don't understand what delayed hay is, it just means that we're delaying the first cut of hay until after uh, birds at risk have, have nested and fledged. For example, the bobolink. The bobolink is a ground nester and it nests in longer grass. And so hay fields are ideal. You'll see them nesting in wheat fields as well. But after they have left, you can continue to cut your hay. So there's a, re a reduced rate for that because you'd be, st you'd be still getting a crop off that. Funds are for maintenance of the projects, providing ecosystem service. So the funds that, that are offered to the landowner are meant to be for the maintenance of those projects. And so we have checks and balances in place. Um, the, some of the members, uh, on the committee are farmer liaisons. They're the ones um, working with the landowners and checking up on their project to see not only the progress, but also that, you know, it's not being plowed away year after year and it ends up with nothing. So there's a bit of a, uh, so it's the monitoring that we're doing with that as well. So, you know, if they're getting a 225 an acre payment, uh, we have to double check that that's actually on the landscape. So it's just reassurance. Now, all stewardship project types are available. Um, you know, your grasslands, trees, wetlands, um, and they may sometimes provide implement funds in some cases. So we can stack all of these things together in some cases, depending on what your project looks like to get you the best value. We try to bring in all the funding programs that we can find and bring them to the lower Thames so that we can offer them to landowners to do these ecosystem services and uh, improve the environment. So that's it for me. Um, please put your questions in the chat and we will answer those at the end. Thank you very much. All right, can you, uh, can you hear me all right? Is that coming through? I can. Okay, perfect. One sec here, I'll get my presentation up. All right, so uh, this is our last presentation of the webinar. So I'm Colin Little. I'm the uh, Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority's Agricultural Program Coordinator. Um, so what does that mean? Well, uh, I kind of manage a number of our different agricultural focused initiatives. Um, many are focused around the issue of nutrient loading um, and harmful algae blooms, which I'm going to discuss tonight. Um, others are focused around soil health, which we'll also talk about a little bit. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the members of, of uh, my team and the people that I work with on these various projects. I mean, a lot of the work I'm about to discuss is not solely done by me. It's uh, definitely a, a team effort here. So. So um, in terms of agenda, I want to kind of take a step back and really break down the Lake Erie harmful algae bloom issue and phosphorus loading in the context of what's occurring in the Thames River. So, you know, I don't generally talk about this too much anymore because, you know, with, we've talked about this for, for decades with, um, with farmers. And I think they're well aware of, of what's occurring, but uh, with an audience that's a bit mixed, I think it's valuable to touch base on what's what's occurring throughout the, the basin and some of the challenges associated with phosphorus loading. Um, and from there, I, I really want to focus on some of the great things that are happening within our watershed and a lot of the actions that are being taken by by regional farmers, um, as well as researchers and different people in the area. So we'll get into that as well. 
It's going to start off a bit gloomy, though. I will forewarn you. Um, I think we're all aware of, of harmful algae blooms in Lake Erie um, all over the world and freshwater bodies as well as saltwater, saltwater bodies. Harmful algae blooms are a significant issue we're facing. Um, in the contents of Lake Erie, uh, the general issue is as a result of runoff of phosphorus and, and nitrogen uh, into our water bodies, um, which is contributing to the development of these harmful algae blooms. So the blooms you're looking at here are actual pictures taken from um, flyovers of the western basin of Lake Erie. Uh, this was from 2019. And you can see this, this definitive color, which you often see associated with algae blooms. So this is a cyanobacteria bloom, uh, blue or green algae bloom. And the reason why we're particularly concerned about these is they have the capacity to, to do a number of things. One, um, they can significantly change the dissolve oxygen levels. In, in a water body, in a fresh water body, creating hypoxic zones. So uh, what's a hypoxic zone? Essentially that means a, you know, a significantly reduced area of oxygen to the point where it can cause significant die-offs of fish. So I'm sure people have seen you know, those news stories in the past where tons of fish end up washing up on shore and on beaches. Um, the central basin of, of Lake Erie and the central basin is a significant hypoxic zone. So. That's one reason why we're very focused on trying to reduce the occurrence and severity of these blooms. Um, another is there's a significant threat to our freshwater uh, source that we re rely on for drinking. Uh, so people re may remember in 2014, the city of Toledo, which is just, just off the Maumee River uh, in Ohio, had to shut down their water for multiple days to the entire city as a result of a harmful cyanobacteria bloom that created a toxin called microcystin. So, um, it's a significant issue. It's a big problem. Uh, we've been talking about it for years, and it's not just specific to, to our geography. This is something that is occurring in, in different areas of the world. Um, and Lake Erie is definitely a, a prime lake for something like this to occur, as well as Lake St. Clair. They're both very shallow lakes, very uh, biologically active lakes. Um, they, they warm up in the summer months to the point where these, this type of algae can develop. Um, and we can talk a bit more about that. Something else that's worth noting too is, you know, it's, this is not just a Western Lake Erie problem. Uh, we, we have had a lot of blooms in recent years in the Thames River. Uh, for the last five years, we've had blooms. Um, so um, some years they've been more significant than others, but uh, they've generally occurred from August to October. Um, so, you know, we do have our own regional challenge here within this watershed that we have to address, uh, regardless of what's happening in the broader lake. Um, you know, there, there are implications associated with the, the land management practices within our own watershed. So what's causing these harmful algae blooms? Snowmelt events or, or water flow events from urban and agricultural landscapes. Uh, so, you know, generally what happens, right, in hydrology, we have a, a big rain event that comes through, it causes runoff, water leaves, the landscape, whether it's a farm or the city, ends up in your watershed. As it's leaving the landscape, it's picking up, you know, potentially phosphorus, um, sediments, uh, nitrogen, and that's eventually making its way into water bodies. So that's kind of the pathway it's taking to our creeks, which ultimately ends up in our lakes. Um, furthermore, another challenge that's contributing to this issue is our changing climate. And this is something that's going to be really interesting to look at in the future. Um, as we collect more data, but the increased frequency of severe storms is, is having a big impact on phosphorus loads and it's making it extremely challenging to implement solutions to um, mitigate those loads. I mean, when you get six inches of rain in 12 hours, like we saw some of those, those rain events in, in uh, Dutton or the eastern area of our watershed um, this past summer, I mean, it, it becomes very challenging to put put systems in place that can that can do much um, in that scenario to reduce runoff and retain nutrients. So, you know, climate change is a big factor. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, and uh, it's something we got to be paying attention to. Um, another factor when it comes to the causes of harmful algae blooms is the internal phosphorus that's already in our lake systems, right? So we've, I mean, loading is a natural phenomenon to some extent, right? You're always going to have uh, loading occurring. Regarding it, regardless of what's going on in your upstream watershed. However, um, we do have a significant amount of phosphorus that's in our lake systems from, you know, the way I use land development that's occurred in, in our area over the last couple hundred years. So 
there's already a large internal phosphorus source, um, you know, in our in our lakes. Um, something else that's a bit new, which we don't quite have a conclusive understanding of yet, is we are seeing higher concentrations of dissolved phosphorus, which is is a bit of an issue because, unlike particulate phosphorus, dissolved phosphorus is readily available for for algae or for anything to grow, right? So if you have a high concentration of dissolved P or soluble reactive P, you know, you're really gonna have the right conditions for algae to just take off, right? So that's that's a bit concerning. Um, something also that's a little still uncertain is how um, new invasive species are affecting uh, water quality and nutrient cycling within the Great Lakes themselves. So I'm sure many of you have seen, you know, the pictures of zebra and quagga mussels, which are an invasive that's quite prevalent now um, in the Great Lakes uh, that got here from, it was ballast water from, from some of the lake ships. And anyways, they're everywhere now. And it's, there's some considerations around how they might be changing how um, essentially uh, nutrients are cycled uh, along our near shore areas and how that might be potentially contributing to um, the availability of dissolved pea, but there's still a lot of, a lot of science occurring there. Uh, this is a picture of Lake St. Clair. Um, I always like to show this picture. We often see these satellite images of the western base of Lake Erie, but I think it's important to acknowledge that Lake St. Clair, St. Clair also has a big issue with harmful algae blooms. Um, and, you know, we are a big contributor to Lake St. Clair, uh, the watershed that is the Thames River. Um, so we do have a challenge to address here. Um, in addition to that, uh, I just want to kind of step back a little bit and look at how this, this issue has occurred over the years and the history of loads in Lake Erie. So if we go back to the, the early, sorry, late 60s, you know, obviously um, this was a different time, you know, um, you know how we manage our, our uh, effluent uh, was, was very different uh, and we had significant phosphorus loads um, and pollution in our, in our water courses. So um, some of you may remember when the Great Lakes Water Quality Act was signed between the U.S. Uh, and Canada, I think it was possibly in 72, I think it's actually our, our 30 year anniversary of that or something, or 50 or something. So anyways, it's, it's, um, it's a very significant agreement because essentially there was a lot of joint targets that were set between the states and Canada to address environmental issues in the Great Lakes. So um, that happened right around this time period in the 70s. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but thereafter you start to see that actions began to be taken to reduce phosphorus loads. So for a while, uh, we significantly reduced our loads. And, and a big chunk of what was occurring then was we were going after point sources. So you're going to hear me talk about point sources a lot. So, so what's a point source? I mean, if it's a wastewater treatment plant, it's it's the pipe that's discharging into, into the creek or into the lake or whatever it is, right? It's a, a defined point that that's contributing that that uh, nutrient load or, or pollution. So um, so in those scenarios, they're very cost effective uh, solutions to address that type of, of nutrient loading, right? You have a defined point, you can implement solutions. It's, it's much, much easier and much more cost effective to address that type of loading. Uh, so they went after that in the 70s uh, with relatively good success to the point where, where we did see the lakes bounce back fairly, fairly well. Um, once we started to get into the 90s, we started to have issues again with, with, uh, with algae blooms in Lake Erie um, and other areas. So um, that's, that's kind of where we're at now. And you can see we've plateaued to some degree in terms of where our loads are at. I mean, every year's variable based on on runoff and precipitation and how much rain we get in a given year. Um, but generally speaking, we, we have not had many major reductions um, in the last you know 20 to 30 years. So when we look at the sources across the basin, you know, this is essentially a map of the entire Lake Erie Basin. Um, you know, we can kind of see where most of the phosphorus is coming from. Um, so, you know, uh, the interesting thing about this map is the stream's width is actually scaled relative to its load. So if you look at the Maumee River, which is one of the largest basins and watersheds in, in Lake Erie, uh, there's a significant load coming from the Maumee River. Uh, you know, one, one reason for that is, is, is just the scale of the Maumee River. Uh, but a secondary reason is obviously there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of very productive agricultural land in this area um, and uh, a lot of different sources of, of phosphorus coming from this area uh, in terms of, uh, you know, all sorts of different egg operations um, and, and different urban centers that are contributing phosphorus. So, you know, that is a big portion of the load. That's why the Maumee River has its own specific target to reduce phosphorus. Um, 
In addition to that, you know, we look at other big targets to the Western Basin and we see the huron Erie Corridor. So this is where the Thames River is eventually feeding to, right? And it's also a significant contribution. Um, so one thing to note is these, you know, these loads are means for the annual periods of 2003 to 2013. And you'll notice for our area, the huron Erie Corridor, point sources were uh, a very significant significant chunk of the pie. And, um, you know, the reason for this was primarily from Detroit at that time. They've done a lot in the last 10 years to, to reduce their point source pollution from, from wastewater treatment plants. So that pie would look very different now, um, but, you know, it's, it's worth noting. So, and you'll see the Thames over here. And uh, from 2003 to 2013, it was roughly about 323 uh, metric tons of total phosphorus was our kind of our average in that period for our loads. So, so what happened? We had an issue with phosphorus loading. Uh, you know, essentially the binational committee, uh, so the U.S. and, and Canada, uh, set a target to reduce uh, total phosphorus and soluble reactive phosphorus uh, entering the western and central basin of Lake Erie by 40% based on our 2008 levels uh, to reduce hypoxic zones in the central Lake Erie area. Um, so the whole thought process is if we can reduce total phosphorus and soluble reactive phosphorus, um, we should be able to get these, these, um, these algae blooms down to a point of severity where you know, their, their implications on water quality and dissolved oxygen levels uh, in Lake Erie are somewhat mitigated, right? They're, they're a natural phenomenon. We're always going to have them to some, some extent, but um, the severity of them is not currently uh, at, a, at a point that is, is sustainable by any means. And this is quite a risk to us. So um, that's the target that's been set uh, through this Canada Ontario Lake Erie Action Plan. Um, many stakeholders uh, have have signed on to different actions to reduce uh, phosphorus loads, um, whether it's cities, municipalities, uh, agricultural organizations, conservation authorities. Um, it's, it's an interesting document. And if you're very engaged in this issue, check it out. Uh, but another important thing to note about the Canadian tributaries, there's some priority tributaries that have significant loads and the Thames River is one of those, um, as well as the Leamington tributaries. So the Thames River and the Leamington tributaries are our priority area is to reduce phosphorus by 40%. And that's because they're contributing to the development of near shore algae blooms. So essentially for the Thames River, that's Lake St. Clair. Um, if we're talking about the Leamington tributaries, that's greenhouse country. And yeah, we're talking about the Northern border of the Western basin of Lake Erie. So let's focus on the Thames River. We are the, the Lower Thames Conservation Authority. So that's kind of where we, we operate. Um, and, you know, there's some unique characteristics about our watershed that we have to consider when we're assessing the phosphorus loading issues. So it is a relatively large watershed. Um, it's the second largest on our size besides the Grand that drains into Lake Erie. Uh, it's a, roughly about 5,700 square kilometers. Uh, it's interesting to look at the profile of the Thames River. You can see when we're in the upper reaches up around Tavistock, uh, we have quite quite the severe drop in elevation uh, and once we get down to Delaware this is where the lower Thames boundary starts it's it becomes much more flatter we have a bit bit of variation in slope and elevation coming from Delaware and Wardsville but once we get down to Kent County we are flat and, and we're well aware of that if we live in this area um, another important thing to note is essentially the land use within our watershed so Roughly about 82% of, of the land within the Thames River Basin is used for agricultural production. Um, that's important to know when we talk about sources to phosphorus loading in our watershed. Um, in terms of urban area, it's about roughly about 8%. Tree cover overall, we're about 8.7%. Um, so those are some important factors to consider. Our population is about 600,000. So, yeah. So when we look at the sources within our own watershed from a study we did in 2015, um, you can kind of get an idea of, of where uh, the phosphorus and, and nitrogen is coming from in our watershed. So when it comes specifically to phosphorus, we expect about 13% of that's coming from wastewater treatment plants. So, you know, just to understand this, these are results from models. So there, you know, there is variations and annual period periods can change, but 13% is, is the general number we're going with. So, that means about 87% is coming from non-point sources. And those non-point sources can be a mixture of both urban and rural 
runoff uh, that are contributing to it, but we're fairly confident about 70, probably 70 to 80% of that non-point source is coming from agricultural sources. And, and one of the reasons for that is it's just a pure magnitude of how much agricultural land is within our watershed. So, you know, an individual field may not be losing much, much phosphorus. You might be losing anywhere from half a kilogram per hectare to, you know, 1.5 to 2 kilograms per hectare, depending on the year and your soil type, um, which is not much relative to how much phosphorus you're applying, uh, whether it's through manure or fertilizers, right? You're, you're pretty efficient. But um, the issue is, is what do you, you, when you add that up, for all the acreage within our watershed that that's in uh, you know annual crops uh, it's it becomes quite significant it's it becomes a quite significant number to the the load of, at the watershed outlet so that's something to note and i'll talk a bit about that challenge because it really speaks to how i dynamic of an issue this is so just to continue to look at this in a bit more detail we got to kind of understand how phosphorus leaves agricultural landscape right so you know, it's important to understand that soil P is highest at the surface. Um, it's going to vary. Phosphorus is going to vary a lot depending on your soil type. Um, some farmers that are on, they just have inherent risk associated with what soil they're farming. If you're on a, a heavy clay soil, a Brookston clay, that are very common to, uh, you know, McGregor Creek and the upland areas or, or Jeanette's Creek or Big Creek, if you're in Western Kent, uh, southwestern Kent that is those are those are tough soils to, to, to deal with from a, a loading perspective I mean you just they have an inherent characteristics that lead to them having higher levels of uh, particular phosphorus and total phosphorus um, there's also issues with wind and water erosion right that, that contribute to uh, to essentially soil erosion uh, so generally what occurs though right is we essentially see a rain event comes through or a melt event that water gets moving the soil gets saturated and that water is going to leave the landscape from one of two pathways over the surface or through the subsurface, right? So we obviously have a lot of systematic tile drainage and subsurface tile drainage. Um, that is our number one pathway in Chatham Cat. The vast majority of our water is leaving through tile drainage. I'd probably, you know, the very vast majority of it. Not to say that we don't have surface water runoff, we still do. Um, that surface water runoff is particularly challenging from a loading perspective. You're always going to have higher levels of, of total phosphorus and particulate phosphorus from surface water runoff. So one of the big goals is always to find ways to get water infiltrate through your soil, get it percolating through that soil matrix to reduce how much phosphorus could end up leaving, leaving your field. Um, other risks of erosion and phosphorus loading are generated from your slopes. You know, do you have compacted soil? Compaction is a big issue in agriculture right now. Um, you know, which someone could talk about for, for 30 minutes, probably more, but that, that's, you know, that's a, that's a challenge for sure. And it contributes to water quality issues. When you have compacted soils, you get way less infiltration uh, and, and your potential for surface water runoff goes, goes up significantly. Um, fro frozen soils are a challenge too. Another issue where you don't necessarily get good infiltration if you get a rain on a frozen soil. Um, scenarios where you don't have a lot of residue on your soil, where, where maybe you're in a very heavy tillage operation and you, you have low crop residue, could have implications on your soil health. Um, and we can talk about all those things when we get to solutions. One last thing I want to talk about the problem, and after this, I'll stop talking about the, the challenge, I promise, but is, uh, is understanding the seasonality of phosphorus loading and nutrient loading. Um, and the big thing here to really understand is generally, generally speaking, we do not have a nutrient loading issue in the summer. It's just, it's just the way hydrology works, right? There's, there's demand for water on the landscape. We don't have much runoff. You know, we have a lot of crop demand and demand for nutrients on the landscape. Um, you know, we don't see a lot of runoff in the summer months. I mean, talk to any farmer, your tiles generally aren't running that much in the summer. There's, there's the odd event, but even when there is a big event, you have, you know, living plants on the vast majority of the landscape to hold on to those nutrients, which is a big factor. Um, where we do have a problem with phosphorus loading and nutrient loading, as you can see from this chart, is from October to April. That is our period when we are when we are losing all of our phosphorus and nitrogen. So that's what we got, this is where we have the target solutions. We got to figure out things that work in this time period to address this issue, um, which is really important. Another big important thing for Chatham Kent and the western southwestern portion um, and clay plains of the Lake Erie Basin is understanding that our predominant pathway for water flow is subsurface tile drainage. 
So, you know, buffers are awesome. They're great. I, there's a lot of good reasons to, to promote buffers. I'm not going to suggest there isn't. Um, but when it comes to addressing this issue in our watershed, we need to be looking at land management practices in the field as well. We got to consider what's going on in the field because that's ultimately going to have the biggest bang for our buck when it comes to reducing phosphorus loads and nitrogen loads. So I'll, I'll talk about that later too. Um, and yeah, I think at this point we can kind of stop talking about the problem and the issue and kind of transition to what's been going on. So some local actions, solutions, things that can be done. So just to start as a bit of a primer, you know, what, what are we trying to achieve with our agricultural programs, the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority? And, and it's, it's really, you know, it's all about working with farmers to find ways to increase the adoption of best management practices. And, and we want to do that uh, to improve our watershed soil health, which has a huge, huge opportunity to address so many different environmental challenges we have in our watershed is by improving our soil health. Um, and also to re reduce agriculturally sourced phosphorus loads in the Thames River Basin, uh, which connects back to obviously, you know, the, the algae blooms in Lake Erie uh, and, and Lake St. Clair and the Thames River itself. Um, in addition to that, we want to enhance our subwatershed water quality monitoring programs in the Lower Thames watershed. We, we want to ensure we have good regional data to validate what works on our soils, what works, you know, in our agricultural operations, what works for our farmers, you know, those types of things are huge and, and, and provide a lot of more confidence in, you know, in the data we're collecting and the conclusions we're drawing. We need to ensure that we have robust local data uh, to inform provincial and federal policy decisions. If we don't have good data from our area, uh, you know, the, the potential for poor policy is, is high. So that's very important. So we're working hard to, to improve that. Um, and then the other big thing is really to share research and monitoring results uh, with local farmers and watershed stakeholders um, and also policymakers to, to inform decision making. So that's a bit of what we're doing tonight. So thank you guys all for, for paying attention to this, uh, this presentation. So, you know, what are some of the solutions to addressing phosphorus loading in agriculture? Um, I'll, I'll stop there for a second and just say that there might be a lot of urban people on this on this presentation. If if you do want to learn a bit more about what you can do in the urban setting, I, I believe Mike Smith might be presenting. Is it next week, Anastasia? Uh, am I right about that, or I might have the date mm -hmm. wrong? But there, sorry, go okay, okay. So yeah, so he's <laughs> anyway. So yeah, he's going to be talking about. I think greening your grounds and different types of things you can be doing um, in an urban setting to, to reduce runoff and things, which ultimately contributes to reducing phosphorus loads as well as planting native species and all sorts of things. So, you know, that'd be a really good one to chime in, chime into if you're trying to figure out what you can do from the urban perspective. But, I, you know, you're, you're here from the egg guy right now. So I'm going to talk all about egg. Um, but, um, you know, one important thing to understand is that, you know, there's, there is no silver bullet solution. There really isn't. There isn't one, a one size fits all approach to this. It's an extremely dynamic issue. Um, and the reality is, is that every farm operation, you know, to some extent, every field, you know, might have a different sweet or recommended approach to, to reducing your phosphorus load. Uh, that, you know, one thing I generally say, and this is true for most farmers are trying to do this regardless, but if you're implementing practices to improve your soil health, if that's your objective, I mean, nine times out of 10, you're likely also, you know, reducing the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen and, and erosion that's coming off your field. So, you know, if you're moving towards um, reduced tillage systems, um, planting cover crops, you know, which I'll talk about a bit more in a second, um, trying to get organic amendments back in your rotation uh, in terms of your fertility programs, um, I mean, crop rotation is, is massive. Having a diverse crop rotation with, with some winter cereals in there uh, can open the door to allowing you to do so much more from a, you know, from a cover cropping perspective or, or a fertility perspective. Um, addressing compaction, soil compaction is huge. Uh, those types of things um, are all gonna help from a water quality perspective as well. Uh, not to mention from a climate change perspective too. I mean, the capacity to sequester carbon through, through implementing practices like that is also very significant. So. Um, you know, we could talk more about that, but yeah, then one other big thing to note as well is, is for our nutrient stewardship practices. I mean, every solution is different for every farmer and there's a big bang for your buck to be made just by considering how you're applying your fertilizers. So, um, you know, the four R's stand for, you know, essentially applying your nutrients with the right source at the right rate, at the right time in the right place. So more or less, that means efficiently and effectively applying your fertilizer, right? I mean, and no one wants to 
no one's paying for fertilizer to see it run off in our water courses. But, you know, I think it was alluded to earlier in Sarah's presentation, just, just incorporating your fertilizer, getting it in the ground significantly reduces your risk of runoff. Um, applying it outside of a window where we have, you know, high levels of, of runoff, right? Uh, you know, late in the fall, in the winter, uh, in the early spring, um, is, is a big factor too, right? Uh, using the right rates. Uh, I'll talk more about some funding we're providing for grid and zone soil sampling, which can inform how you can apply, you know, uh, fertilizer where it's needed, as opposed to using blanky applications across the field uh, to reduce your risk of runoff. There's there's a lot you can do just by evaluating your fertility program. And I mean, sometimes it's easier said than done, but it's, it's a big factor. I, I won't talk too much about you know, buffers and windbreaks, but they play a role as well. I mean, Craig's talked about it a bit. They play a big role as well. Marginal land restoration is huge too. I mean, if you have marginal land, there's great programs uh, through Alice. If you're losing money in, in scenarios on land because you're, you're poor in input costs and something that's not producing a consistent yield. I mean, a program like the Alice program is, is really what you should be looking at. It's a great opportunity to, to uh, provide some habitat and, uh, and also, you know, flip the script on the profitability of that zone. So um, yeah, something to consider. Uh, road control structures play a role. There's a time and a place for them for sure. Um, we can talk a bit about that too. But for people that might be more from the urban setting, you might be wondering what the heck is a cover crop. So I'll take a second to talk a little bit about that. But generally when you see you know a farmer who's, who's planting annual crops, um, like soybeans or corn, um, what a cover crop would be would be after you've harvested that commodity crop like soybeans you might go out and plant something like cereal rye like a winter cereal or oats and the purpose of that crop uh there, there might be multiple purposes but one of the purposes is really just to essentially protect that soil and have a living root system on that soil and a residue soil surface uh during the non-growing season so when you're going into that that critical period we were talking about earlier when you know, we know there's a lot of potential for runoff and wind erosion and things like that from let's say late October to, to April or May. You have a, a crop there that's just solely protecting your soil um, as well as doing other things in terms of improving your soil health. It can, it can help fixate nitrogen if it's a legume and pump nitrogen into your soil for a crop that you might plant the preceding year or sorry, the following year. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things cover crops can do. It feeds your microbiology in your soil um, all those different organisms that are down in there, your mycorrhizal fungi, all these things that can provide benefits to your crops in the future. So, um, you know, it pumps carbon into your soil. Like there's, there's a lot of, of big things about, about cover crops. Um, and I've been probably not the best person to talk to about it. I'm sure the farmers on the call know a lot of better speakers about it, but, but um, cover crops can play a huge role when it comes, comes to addressing environmental issues, especially in our watershed, 100% in our watershed where we have such a large amount of agricultural acreage. So the, the picture on the right where it's just an example of annual rise. So if you're thinking about this through the lens of phosphorus loading, when you're looking at a, a field that's bare soil going into the non-growing season, you can probably imagine the field on the left is going to perform much better generally from water quality perspective. Um, you know, you have residue protecting the soil, even a wind erosion perspective, right? You have something protecting the soil to keep that soil in place, hold on to those nutrients, um, help water infiltrate down to the soil profile. Whereas a soil like this is going to have a much tougher time with infiltration in a big rain event. The potential for runoff is much higher and uh, surface water erosion, right? So this is just an example. And you'll, you'll see lots of cover crops in the landscape if you're driving around, um, keep an eye out for them for sure. So, so what are some of the things we're doing and what are some of the programs we're providing at the Lower Thames? Um, the McGregor and Jens Creek program is one example. And the objective of this program is essentially, it's run from 2018 to 2022, but the objective is to provide financial support for farmers to adopt best management practices to improve soil health and water quality in the McGregor and Jens Creek of watersheds of the Thames, which are two super challenging watersheds for us from a phosphorus loading perspective. Um, secondary to that, we want to monitor these watersheds aggressively, like rigorously to collect water quality data, water quantity data. Those two things allow us to calculate loads um, and also to collect soil data and weather data and land activity data. You know, what are the, the management practices that are occurring on the landscape? How is that affecting phosphorus, right? Um, and all these things have a big factor on phosphorus loading, all those variables. And what we end up doing um, is we'll, we'll use all that information we're collecting to calibrate a computer model. Um, which we can use to simulate um, 
how BMPs can reduce phosphorus loads. So, you know, we might be able to say if farmers cover the landscape with 20%, 20% of the acres in these watersheds is covered with cover crops, how much phosphorus would we expect to reduce, right? It's, it allows us to strategically plan around that and report back to the government in terms of, you know, these are the actions farmers are taking locally. Here's the results of it, right? Um, and another big factor here to understand is it's so important these models are are calibrated and configured using regionally collected data. If they're not, they produce really poor results. So um, that's another big, big factor here. So what kind of things are we providing funding for here? A lot of the things we just discussed, right? So planting cover crops, um, for our nutrient stewardship practices, you know, soil sampling, uh, um, grid and zone soil sampling, things like writing, you know, getting an agronomist to write you a new fertility plan, those types of things. Um, different ways of applying phosphorus. Uh, strip tillage is something you might hear a lot about these days. There's, there might be some farmers in the call that are doing this where, you know, you reduce the area where you till your field and you leave, you know, residue between, you know, where, where you'll be seeding the next fall. Um, it, it's a huge, huge thing that can really make it a lot easier to manage cover crops. Um, so that's something that, that people are doing. Um, also variable rate applications of phosphorus is a big thing too. Uh, applying you know, not applying the same rate across the entire field, applying it where it needs to go. Um, erosion control structures, uh, wind breaks, buffer strips, you know, marginal land restoration, all these things are being funded through the program and promoted. Um, this is just some implementation numbers. You can kind of see from 2020 and 2021, we, we did have increases in the program um, in terms of the acreage of implementation. Important to note, we are restricted by budget. There is a lot more going on out there than what we're just solely funding. So, you know, this isn't necessarily representative of the entire acreage of what's occurring in those watersheds. Um, and the point I wanna just bring home here is, is a bit about our, our monitoring network and what we're doing to, to improve how we're collecting data in these watersheds. So since 2017, new monitoring stations, um, predominantly in these two sub watersheds, there's more that we've commissioned across the entire lower temps watershed, uh, but today I'm just focusing on our agricultural projects. Um, and, you know, what we're doing at these stations is we're collecting essentially, you know, a number of different different types of data, environmental data, primarily water quality data, water quantity data, precipitation data, so rain data um, is collected at these stations. And we have stations that are set up to representation of the different characteristics of, you know, the land management practices within these watersheds, right? So. <laughs> We have some stations at agricultural fields where we're literally measuring what's coming off of fields and uh, through subsurface tile drainer systems. Um, we have others of municipal drains and water courses, and you know some in creeks themselves, things like that. So you know, since 2017, generally we've been collecting anywhere from 600 to 1,000 samples per year uh, from these stations that are analyzed for nutrient parameters to calculate nutrient loads. So that's a huge improvement. Prior to that. There was not a lot going on here. Uh, it was there was some stuff occurring, but we didn't have a high intensity of data, which which um, can lead to issues. Uh, this is one program I want to talk about, which is a bit of an example of how we're engaged in some broader provincial efforts. Um, the on farm program is the on farm applied research and monitoring program, which is administered by Ontario Soil and Crop, and it kind of feeds into our whole model of how we water monitor some watersheds and and evaluate within those subwatersheds, what practices are effective at reducing phosphorus loads and improving soil health. So you'll see here, there's a number of conservation authorities throughout the entire Southwestern Ontario area that have similar things set up to what we're doing in Jeanette's Creek and McGregor Creek. Um, for this project specifically, we're just looking at a 20 square kilometer area of Jeanette's Creek. If you go on our YouTube channel, you can see a video about what we're doing out there, some of the results, I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, then you can get a better idea of what's going on there. But the neat thing about this project is it's it's also very focused on partnerships with farmers. So there's I think there's 25 paired soil health test trials going on across all of Ontario where farmers are testing the efficacy of different BMPs at improving soil health. Um, in addition to that, some of those are paired with water quality monitoring setups too. So there's a lot of really interesting things occurring with this project. And there's actually a forum in February where everyone, we're going to dig, dig into that in a lot more detail. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I encourage you to go to OSCIA's website, the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, and uh, sign up for that forum, and you can learn a lot more about what's occurring there. 
So this is a quick example of what we're doing in our on-farm some watershed in Jeanette's Creek. Uh, so we're working with two farmers to essentially evaluate how um, implementing uh, two different systems on a Brookston clay soils, so those heavy clay soils that are really challenging to, to reduce phosphorus on. Uh, and we're evaluating, you know, a, a no-till continuous cover crop system. Uh, when what that means is essentially the farmer isn't tilling a soil. Uh, and he's uh, planting corn, soybeans, soybeans, and wheat in his rotation. Um, and he always ensures that after an annual crop, he has some type of cover crop planted. Uh, usually it's cereal rye if it's a crop that comes off late in the year. Uh, if it's after winter wheat, he might be planting a 16 species diverse mix of cover crops. That's great for pollinators and all sorts of things. Uh, then we're also looking at a conservation tillage system. Uh, which is also interesting as well, um, and a similar rotation too. So, um, and same thing at these sites, you can see examples of how we set stuff up and how we're monitoring surface water runoff and how we've set up the tile drainage system so we can measure the water quality that's coming off the field to the, the drainage system there too. So I don't have time to talk about all this data. I, I'd love to, but uh, if you want to learn more about it, get a hold of me after. Um, but some preliminary results that we're seeing uh, from the early days, um, you know, we can't really draw conclusions from this. An issue like this, 18 months of data is, is not representative of enough to really say anything with certainty. But um, the site that says MA here, that you're looking at in this chart, represents the conservation tillage site. Uh, and MB represents the, the continuous no-till cover crop site. So, um, you know, we are getting a lot of validation of what we would have expected. The majority of the loads are occurring not in the summer. You'll notice there's, in this scenario, there's not even a load in the summer. We, we had, I mean, that's not always true, forewarning, but that was just that year. Um, and the loads are lower at the no-till continuous cover crop site, which is interesting to see. I think that's kind of showing how significant a role cover crops can play in this, this, uh, this issue. Um, but once again, it's early days. You'll also notice that the vast majority of the loading is occurring during the non-growing season, right? Once again, that's that seasonality factor. Um, here's something interesting, though, that's that's worth noting is uh, we are seeing significant, significantly lower concentrations of total phosphorus in the samples we're collecting from the no-till continuous cover crop site. So that's important um, for sure. That's a, that's an early indication that you know of things to come because our sample sizes are much larger in those scenarios. Uh, the one thing that's interesting though is soluble reactive phosphorus, which we talked about earlier, that's that very bioavailable form. We're not having any certainty at this time, at least in terms of differences from the two systems. So something to note too. And this is one of the last slides I got, um, but I just want to really talk about this because it's uh, essentially Dan Bittman on our team uh, put this together and it, it shows the loading numbers uh, from some, some key sub watersheds in the Thames River and the Kent County area. And it, it shows their relative load to the rest of the Thames River. And um, why this is really important is this: these loads were calculated based on the intensive sampling we're now doing in our watershed, whereas before that wasn't happening. You know, we, we maybe had 12 samples for a year, if that, um, from a given site. Now we have anywhere from 60 to 100. So, um, we're finding now that there is much larger loads than we would have expected from some areas. So Jets Creek and McGregor Creek are particularly significant areas for, for loads that are contributing to the Thames River. So if you look here, the McGregor Creek watershed, the Jets Creek watershed and the Big Creek watershed are likely contributing 31% in 2020 to the overall load of the Thames River, which we're estimating is around 631 metric tons of total phosphorus uh, to Lake Sinclair. So this kind of flips the script a bit. Uh, initially, a lot of people suspected the upland watersheds were the biggest issue, but I think it goes to show that with a non-point source pollution issue, it's it's much more wider spread. I mean, um, and these, the soils, some of the soils that are found in these watersheds, some of the heavy clays um, can be quite challenging uh, uh, to deal with from reducing your phosphorus loads. Um, so, yeah, that's just one thing I wanted to point out. And this is just a map, just to just in case, you know, I, I know us Conservation Authority people, we can talk about some watersheds all day, but it may not mean anything to you. Um, so Jeanette's Creek is here, you know, McGregor Creek is here, and uh, Big Creek is here. So it's kind of this southwestern portion. 
It should be noted though too about that data. We we do need to improve our data collection throughout the watershed as well. So as that occurs, we'll be interested to see what happens. Last but not least, the soil health program. So this is a new program we launched in 2021 and it's watershed wide. So it's not so watershed specific um, and there is funding to plant cover crops um, where there was this past year uh, across the watershed. So the numbers aren't final. We're working diligently to try and process all the claims as we speak, but uh, we're aiming, our target was looking good at about 10,000 acres uh, of cover crops just through this specific program and a number of acres of soil sampling as well. So we've had, there's lots of farmers out there that are, are really doing a lot to try and do things to improve their soil health and, and improve the, the watershed's water quality. Um, one, one thing I can say is this program will be back in 2022. So if you've stuck around for the end of this presentation, uh, we will be um, relaunching this in 2022, likely in March, we'll start accepting applications and it, it will function a bit differently this year because of the funding source. Uh, it will be a dollar per acre incentive. Um, however, the funding, we will ask farmers to essentially uh, agree to plant a target acreage for multiple years. Uh, so for two years, but what will come along with that is additional security around funds. We'll provide funds for, for two years each year. So that's interesting. Um, and yeah, in, in addition to that, um, I think it's worth noting that the source for this funding is is not actually related to, to phosphorus loading. Um, it's related to carbon sequestration and helping us achieve our, our uh, objectives to reduce carbon uh, in Canada. So yeah, there's there's a lot that can be done with cover crops. All right, and I know I've talked probably for way too long. So here's my closing remarks. Um, you know, I guess I just, I like to say, you know, we are facing a very significant phosphorus loading and nutrient loading and, and, and soil health, you know, challenge in the Lake Erie Basin. Um, you know, I didn't talk much about soil degradation and things like that, but we have some legitimate challenges on that front. There's no doubt about it. Um, and it's by no means an easy challenge to address. I mean, uh, you know, the non-point source pollution like runoff and, and nutrient loading is is very difficult to to address especially when you're talking about only losing you know anywhere from half a kilogram to you know 1.5 kilograms per hectare of phosphorus per year i mean it's it's it is tricky to to get that down um but um you know i think it's important to understand um, when, when the loading is occurring, so we know it's occurring during the non-growing season, we need to implement solutions that, that can address um, runoff and, and loading during that time range. Um, and furthermore, we got to understand that it's not going to, it's not going to happen right away, right? You know, there's farmers that have done a lot in the last five to six years to do things to, to address this. And it's going to take time for us to see downstream impacts, right? Um, as, as I'm sure a lot of the farmers in the call know, it's, you know, it's, it's a long game. You don't plant cover crops one year and then oh, immediately your soil is, you know, rejuvenated. It's a, uh, it's a continual thing you got to stick to for, for years. Um, so, you know, temper expectations, um, you know, for, for people that are, uh, you know, expecting this this issue to go away overnight. Understand that's not how it's, how it's going to play out. Um, it's going to it's going to take a, a long time, and and it's going to take repeated efforts by a lot of people and, and a lot of adoption across our watershed to make this this uh, this one go away. So yeah, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And uh, yeah, I just also want to say, you know, these these programs are a great opportunity for for uh, local farmers and. Uh, different industry reps. We've had lots of great farm businesses, retailers that are helping us out on this front, um, you know, to work with us to show that we're leaders at addressing this issue. Um, you know, this is how we do it through means like this. And um, yeah, thanks for everyone that's participated in the past. And feel free to get hold of me if you want to talk about phosphorus. I am always available. So yeah. Thank you. All right, so I'm Sarah Cook, I'm the Outreach Specialist. And uh, first off, I just wanna say everybody did a great job uh, doing their presentations. I learned a lot and I, and I worked there, so that was awesome. Um, I'll do, I'm, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. And I'll do my best to get to everybody's questions here. I'll start with the ones in the chat. So I'm the Outreach Specialist and I work with Colin and right now I'm working on the Soil Health Program stuff with him. And all right, we'll get started here. So Alexa says, what does typical maintenance for a wetland look like? The it's typical- not, it's, Yeah, sorry. it's not directed to anybody, but um, go ahead, Greg. 
Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, typically, uh, wetland maintenance is keeping out your invasives, and predominantly that would be Phragmites. So, um, you know, we, we like to dig wetlands and we know they have a lot of great function, but you need to be able to watch out for that Phragmites and, and try to keep that um, eliminated because it will take over. And so, um, you know, and you can do that in many ways, but the best way is to make sure it does not start. If it, you know, if it, if it does, if you do see a patch, it's, um, it's worth getting rid of it immediately, okay? Because it will take over. But otherwise, um, not a whole lot. You need to make sure that there aren't any other invasive plants keeping out invasive species like something like goldfish, for instance. You know, you don't wanna be putting uh, foreign fish in your wetland pond or, you know, things like that. And then uh, as far as plant species, you wanna, you, wanna, you know, try to uh, promote your native species, grasses and shrubs, trees, uh, and, and, you know, get the natural habitat going. I would say that's your main, main concern. And if you have um, drainage function on it, like some wetlands are, are passive. They don't require any kind of uh, infrastructure. Some of them have control structures and outlets, which in some cases may need to be maintained depending on your project. Okay, it was also kind of a two point two part question. So they also said, can you speak more about grassed waterways? Okay, so um, grass waterways are a great thing to employ on your fields, as Colin indicated with some of the pictures and, and, um, and things that he was showing is uh, it depends on your, your agricultural system. Um, you know, grass waterways come in handy uh, in those in those steep areas of your field that really channel water at a fast rate when we get a lot of rain all at once. So it's good to have those covered up. But as Colin uh, showed, it's probably beneficial to have the whole field looking like that, especially in the off, uh, not, you know, the non-growing season. So um, grass waterways were, were popular, um, you know, in the 90s and, and they still are somewhat popular. But I think uh, maybe a better option is to go with a full, full on, full field cover crop in the non growing season. Okay, so now we've just have a couple more questions here. Some of these might have been answered as we went along, but I'll still go ahead and read them all out. So Lisa says, can you define sil siltation and turbidity, please? Yeah, if you want, I can, I can take that one. So yeah, essentially, yeah, turbidity is uh, more or less a, it's a measurement of, uh, you know, the infiltration of light through water. So if you have a turbid water, it's, it's uh, generally got a lot of par particles in it, total suspended sediments, right? So it has a very murky look to it. Uh, the Thames often has this look um, where the water is relatively turbid. Um, you know, if anyone's familiar with Jeanette's Creek or McGregor Creek, well, if you see that, that water that looks almost like chocolate milk at times, that's, that's very turbid water, um, if, that, if that makes sense. Okay, and then we've got, does management agreement go with, go with the land? In brackets, they said thinking of sale property. Yeah, I had uh, written an answer, but I'll just speak about it briefly. Oh, sorry, too. sorry. Yeah, no, that, that's perfectly okay. I'll just talk about it out loud as well. That becomes a legal issue with the landowner and the parcel itself. So if the landowner so chooses to retain certain projects or forests or any element of their property on their property after it's sold, then that would, that would come to something that they would put on their title for that property that they would prepare with their own lawyer. Um, we asked the, the landowner to let us know if there is going to be a uh, transfer in land title so that we can have, you know, reach out to that new landowner and uh, have a conversation with them and understand what their intentions are and perhaps uh, talk about the project and its significance. Um, but in the end, it, it really is up to that, that landowner that holds the title. 
Okay, and there's one last answer and you did um, answer it, Greg, but I'm gonna read it out loud just in case there's people who haven't taken a look and maybe they have the same question. Um, it says, are trees and shrubs better than others for planting in tile fields? And so you've got trees like white pine, white oak, sugar maple are more moisture tolerant and would be less attracted to perforated tiles. Shrubs are mostly moisture loving and would be very attracted to water sources like tiles. That said, shrubs are a great way for stream bank stabilization. So I'm just rereading that just in case somebody didn't uh, notice that in the Q&A section there. It's a great question. Yeah, just to be clear, the white pine and white oak are, are uh are drought tolerant like not moist I might have written it wrong there but they like they like it more dry so if you're going to plant trees around water water tiles that you don't want to get plugged with roots you need to choose drought tolerant species such as white pine white oak uh, okay the the shrubs like water so they're not what you want to plant around your tiles all right and there was one more question it's kind of a general statement here um, somebody was just talking about some of the non-native trees that we had for sale and it looks like Anastasia had um, answered that question and just said, you know, if, if you're, she might, you guys might be able to speak to this more, but I'm just trying to look at her answer here. Sometimes the nurseries we work with end up sending us non-native versions of the plants because that's all they have access to. So if anybody had the same question, that's kind of a, uh, just a generalization there. It's not always in our control. It doesn't look like that we can always do a, a native version of the plants. And as of right now, that's the, those are the only questions that I see. Just a lot of- um, One more in the open section, Sarah. Oh, what well, one more snuck in, thanks. Are 15 year agreements binding? Say after 10 years, a landowner wants to sell or develop, are there penalties or actions taken? Uh, again, it's it's up to that landowner that owns that title to establish a formal agreement with their lawyer on the title of that land. So that's how that's dealt with. Um, our agreements that we sign are for maintenance to get the project established. And then at that point, we understand that the landowner is invested and will continue to maintain that project. But in the event that it, it is sold after 10 years, um, it falls on that landowner uh, to either have an agreement on title for that land or discuss intentions with the new new buyer. Okay, great. So um, doesn't look like there's any more questions. I think they've all been answered there. I'm just looking through the chats. I don't think I missed any in there. Everyone's just saying great presentations, which I have to agree. Um, so I'll let it go for another minute. If we don't see any other questions and I guess we can, uh, you can probably wrap this up. Just looking through here, I'm not seeing anything else. Yeah, I think we're good to go. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks everybody for the presentations. They were all fantastic and very informative, and thank you for everybody who came out, and have a great night. Yes, thank you for putting this on, Anastasia. No problem. Enjoy your evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone.